Mr. McCoy here with part 14 of The Castle in the Attic. As you recall, William fell beside the wizard, shaken for a moment. It was the old crone's voice that brought him to his senses. The necklace, she screamed. He reached across the heaving silver chest and snatched it from the wizard's neck. A cry of pain and anger filled the room. William leaped to his feet and backed away from the curled silver figure on the floor. The wizard rose slowly. Close the doors, he ordered the guard in a steely voice, and the man jumped to obey. With the click of the lock, there was complete silence in the room. I am the boy in the legend, Alistair, William gasped, his chest still heaving. I have come to take back the Silver Knight's kingdom. Then a low, horrible cackle bubbled up from deep inside the wizard's throat. And now, fool, you think you have me, but you don't know about the mirror, do you? Both hands were thrust inside the pockets of his billowing robe, searching for something as he advanced on William. The wizard had grown even larger and more menacing with the loss of his necklace, and William continued to back away until he felt the solid form of the Silver Knight behind him. Nobody escapes the mirror. When you look inside it, you will see all the cowardice and hatred and greed inside yourself. Won't he, Calendar? He called out to the old woman without taking his eyes off William. Her only reply was a moan of terror. Calendar has seen the mirror do its work. Beggars and priests and kings have fallen in front of the mirror. What are you but just a small, stupid, terrified boy? The wizard shrieked as he pulled something out of his right-hand pocket and thrust it toward William. William shut his eyes. He couldn't bear to have his journey in this way after everything he'd come through. Open your eyes, fool. You will have to see it. There is no resisting it, the wizard crowed, certain of his victory. William thought once more of Mrs. Phillips, the one person who believed in him. You have inside you the heart and soul of a knight, she had said opened his eyes and looked into the mirror. All he saw was the figure of himself, William, walking slowly but surely toward him. As the figure got closer, he could see the picture of Mrs. Phillips imprisoned inside his heart. What does he see, Calendar? The wizard cried. He sees himself, Alistair, and the lady he has taken prisoner. Nothing else. But I'm here so that lady can go free, William said, his voice powerful in the silent room. He took another step toward the mirror. It no longer scared him. It showed him only what he already knew. With every forward stride that William made, the wizard retreated until he was trapped in a corner of the room, his eyes wide, his mouth open, and waiting for a scream that never came. William reached out and snatched the mirror, turning it on Alistair. What do you think's going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener. The look of horror on the wizard's face was unbearable and William was almost tempted to drop the mirror and break it. Alistair sank to his knees, covering his eyes with his hands. It's the locust, he moaned. The destroyer, the ravager, Calendar shrieked, her arms lifted up to the ceiling. Hatred was etched in every line on her face. Before William could stop her, Calendar had snatched the necklace that dangled from his left hand. She pointed the lead disc at the wizard and mumbled the word, Saturn. Alistair reached up and tried to grab the length of ribbon from her, but she swung it back and forth just above his grasp. His legs had already turned to lead from the feet to the knees, and he began to drag himself about the floor on his elbows trying to catch her. He looked like a wounded animal. Calendar, no, William shouted. Stop it. We can take care of him some other way. Don't do that to him. But she was lost anything but her own revenge. Dancing around the twisted gray form of the wizard, she flipped the lead disc and muttered another word William couldn't hear. Alistair was gone. Before anybody could stop him, William raised his arms and smashed the mirror to the floor. It shattered instantly into a hundred scattered slivers. William stepped across the place where the wizard had twisted in his last agonies and took the necklace from Calendar's hands. 
She gave it up without a word and sank to the floor, sobbing, crouched in her familiar position. He glanced up at the soldiers still standing in attention by the door. They were staring at him speechlessly. I have no wish to fight you, he said. Brian, his guard, was the first to react. My lord, he said with a formal bow, we thank you for our freedom from the wizard's tyranny. We are at your command. Not mine, Brian, but this man's, William said, going over to stand in front of Sir Simon. But how do we break the lead spell? How can we bring him back to life? Brian went to Calendar and muttered something in her ear, but she just shook her head and pushed him away. She will not tell me how to undo the spell, my lord, he said. I don't think she knows how, William said. I guess the wizard never undid any of his spells, but I have an idea. I have brought Sir Simon back to life once. Maybe I can do it again. While the soldiers watched, William put his arms around his old friend and pressed his cheek against the cold metal wrinkles of his tunic. Come back, Sir Simon, he whispered. Your kingdom has been retaken. Suddenly, William felt those arms crushing him in a familiar hug, and he looked up to see the knight's eyes filled with tears. Sir Simon, he cried, you're alive. The knight didn't speak, but held his squire at arm's length as if to study his face more closely. Then he looked slowly around the room. The wizard, he asked. He is gone, we have defeated him. Your weapons were stronger than mine, William. William looked away embarrassed. I see you found yourself a page, he said, taking the lead hands of Dick's son into his own. Gradually, they warmed and turned to flesh. The boy's eyes lost their blank gaze and focused on William. You did as I asked and brought the silver knight to me, William said gently. The boy nodded. What's your name? Tolliver, if you please, sir. William smiled. You weren't calling me sir before, Tolliver. No, the boy replied with a grin. What about the others? Sir Simon asked. How do we bring them back? I think I can do it, William said. It seems to work the same way it did in the castle. He went from one lead figure to another, touching a cheek here, a hand there, until the room was filled with live people asking questions and stretching their stiff limbs. As the story of the wizard's defeat was passed from one to another, they pressed forward to shake William's hand. When that was done, he took Tolliver and Sir Simon over to the corner where Calendar still crouched. He touched her on the shoulder. Calendar, he said softly, I brought some people to see you. Here is Sir Simon and Tolliver, your grandson. She would not look up, but pulled William down beside her. I cannot bear to have them see me like this, a wizened old lady with a black heart. You never knew me to be any different, but Simon was my beloved one from the days before the wizard. Sir Simon took her hands and lifted her up so that he could see her face. Then he hugged her. My beloved old calendar. That hug of Sir Simon's and the love in his voice melted calendar as quickly as William's hands had softened the leaden bodies. For the first time since William had met her, he saw her smile. You do not hate me, my lord, she cried. I should have struggled harder with Alistair to rescue you. Even if you had, there was nothing you could do against his power. These years with the wizard must have been very lonely ones. She closed her eyes as if to shut out the horrible memories. But the wizard's spells are broken thanks to our good friend William. Sir Simon went on. You will stay with me and live out your life in comfort, surrounded by your friends. And your family, William cried, pushing Tolliver forward. The old woman and the young boy stared at each other, then joined hands, then hugged. William thought he'd never seen two people look so happy, and he felt the tears coming into his own eyes. For once, he let them slide down his cheeks, and when Calendar caught sight of them, she reached up to brush them away. It's all right, Calendar. I'm just so happy for you. I know, my gentle lord. I know you are. At a signal from Sir Simon, Tolliver led his grandmother off to a corner of the room where they sat down immediately and began to talk. Now, you must put the necklace on, Sir Simon says. It holds the token you will need for the Lady Eleanor. 
William looked more closely at the prize he'd come such a long way to get. Two medallions dangled from the long red ribbon. The first was the reverse side of the Janus medal that Mrs. Phillips held back in the castle. It looked identical except for a kinder expression on the god's face and the two keys engraved on either side of his head. The keys to her freedom, he said, showing the token to Sir Simon. And this is the lead disc, the knight said. What are those markings on top, William asked. Sir Simon picked up the medal rather gingerly and peered at it. That's the sign of Saturn, he said. According to the old alchemists, lead was associated with Saturn, the god of death and decay, an evil sign. William slipped the lead medal off the ribbon. I only need the Janus token, he said. You take this and keep it somewhere safe. I don't want it to fall into the wrong hands. There was no time for further discussion as the crowds were pressing forward once more. Brian appeared by William's side with a big black cat in his arms. Where did that come from? William asked. The spells are all broken, Brian explained. This is Calendar's cat. You knew him better as the dragon that guarded the castle gates. William looked into the animal's eyes, but he saw no horrible pictures of fire, only a calm, mysterious expression. Suddenly, the cat meowed. I think he's hungry, sir, Brian said. I shall see that he gets something to eat. William was eager to return home immediately, but the Silver Knight insisted that a celebration be held first, so a huge banquet was prepared in the baronial hall upstairs. William sat at the high table between Sir Simon and Dick, the apple tree man, who had come to the castle looking for his son. Each plate was heaped with good things, and each cup was full to the brim. While they waited for all to be seated, William asked Sir Simon something he'd been wanting to know. How did you get out of the forest, Sir Simon? I stood and called your name, hoping my voice would lead you back to me. Sir Simon shook his head, staring down at his plate full of meats, breads, and savories. To think that I should be fooled by the vision of moonlight. But Lord Luck himself must have been walking beside me because eventually, after much wandering and at the edge of despair, I found myself next to a real stream. I followed it out of the forest, knowing that at least I was going in one direction and not in endless circles. He turned to the apple tree man. Tolliver found me and told me that William had gone ahead. I made such haste to catch up with him that I must have passed him all together. I'm afraid he was up a tree for a very long time thanks to me, the apple tree man replied, smiling at William. Well, we are all together now, and that's what counts, said Sir Simon. Standing up, he knocked on the table with his fist until the great hall fell silent. Then he raised his tankard. Here's to young William, who found his own way through the dark forest. He alone has defeated the curse of a man who held our kingdom prisoner for far too long. Let each of us remember the lesson William has taught us. The weapons that you need to fight the battle are inside your own heart. To William, he shouted. To William, answered a hundred happy voices. William jumped to his feet and put up his hands for silence. When the tumult had subsided, he raised his own tankard and shouted, to the Lady Eleanor. To the Lady Eleanor, they roared back. They drank deeply, one and all, and the eating began to the sound of laughter, music, and the cheerful thunk of the wooden bowls against the trestle tables. What is all this food? William asked as one serving plate after another was carried into the banquet hall. Boar's head with pudding, squirrel stew, boiled chickens, cakes with sliced apples, uh, the apple tree man rattled off, pointing to the various piles on William's plate. But where did it all come from? The land I traveled through could not possibly have produced this much food. The moment the wizard was defeated, the land sprang back to life as if there had never been a famine, said the apple tree man. After filling his stomach, William gave up all effort at conversation and sat back to enjoy the scene. The good food and the hot sweet cider lulled him to sleep, and later on in the evening he felt Sir Simon's strong arms carrying him to bed. So there are still some loose ends to be tied up. What are those loose ends? Share with your fellow listener. 
And now moments more of The Castle in the Attic. When William woke the next morning, Tolliver was waiting for him with a basin of water. What will you do now that the wizard is gone? William asked, splashing his face. Sir Simon says I may stay in the castle and be apprenticed to one of the squires. I asked if it could be you, sir, but he told me you were leaving us. I wish you would stay. There is someone waiting for me at home. The thought of Mrs. Phillips made him more eager than ever to be on his way. And we'll find out what happens to William, Mrs. Phillips, and so much more as the castle in the attic concludes. <laughs>